Hello and welcome to our webinar on managing child behaviors. I am Dr. Mandy White-Ajmani. I am the owner of Small Brooklyn Psychology. We are a group practice focused on helping psychological issues for people of all ages and all kinds of different psychological problems. We are located in Brooklyn at Industry City and part of our business is focused on providing neuropsychological assessment doing very thorough, comprehensive investigations, gathering data to really understand the full spectrum of who a person is, and then communicate that information to you in very usable and practical ways. Um, we provide assessment for babies down to 12 months, all the way up to older adults. And then the other part of our business is focused on therapy, helping you to take information about yourself and then make the sorts of changes that you'd like to see. Jill DiPietro, one of our therapists, is an expert in helping to manage and improve behaviors, especially in children. And she works with children themselves, but also very frequently parents, which is a very effective way of helping uh, to improve child behaviors. Now, all of our therapy is founded on evidence-based treatment, which is research-supported ways of improving behavior, uh, typically with a foundation of cognitive behavioral therapy and the particular kinds of treatments that Jill tends to use. She's actually an additional expert on two uh, modes of therapy called parent management training, PMT, and parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT, which are both very uh, useful and effective ways of improving behavior. Jill got her degree from Columbia University, and we are super happy to have her. So she's going to be starting this webinar in just a minute. Um, I also want to thank Park Slope Parents and Premier Pediatrics for being media sponsors of this webinar series. This is actually a monthly series that we started last month, and we will be providing free webinars every month uh, for the next several months on various psychological topics. So definitely feel free to to find out about that and to come to future webinars. You can find out more information there at our website at smallbrooklyn.com slash services slash community talks, I think it is, but there's a, a description of everything that's coming up. Now, Park Slope Parents is, a, is an incredible service in Brooklyn that really offers tons of information and support and meetups and, uh, talks just like these to parents in Brooklyn and beyond. Um, and if you have not checked them out, definitely do so. And then P Premier Pediatrics is a, uh, a practice that has multiple locations throughout New York City. Um, I believe they have three or four at this point and uh, lots of very caring pediatricians and um, great services. So please find out more about them. Now, we're gonna start the talk with Jill. Um, because I screwed up the recording, I actually missed the first couple of minutes of Jill's talk, most of which were actually introductory material like this, so I'm able to just re-record it. But I will say that uh, just as Jill was getting started, she was, she was getting ready to talk about how the pandemic is really affecting children in ways in very similar ways that it's affecting adults. And it's important to recognize that we're all sharing these the stress together and the kind of trauma that comes with it, that it's okay for you to have anxiety, you as a parent to have anxiety about what's going on in the world. And it's okay for you to show that to your children and model the fact that you're also struggling with this, but you have ways of coping with it. And you can do that together, finding ways of taking care of yourself, but then also letting kids know that you're going to do everything that you can to help keep them safe. And then Jill, uh, as we're going to get started with this video, Jill was just getting started talking about the coercive process, which is really the evidence-based model that shows how kids who um, end up with very difficult behaviors, how it gets started in the process of how that gets reinforced in the relationship. So I hope you enjoy and please join us again next month when we come back and talk about a new topic. So what this is, is really a, uh, a way to understand and conceptualize disruptive behavior. So first and foremost, right, child engages in problem behavior. Uh, hey, buddy, turn off the video game. You might have an emotional response because they're clearly not listening. You escalate, they escalate. You escalate again, 
they escalate again, right? And what ultimately ends up happening here is that either the child wins by not doing what you wanted them to, or the escalation is reinforced on your end, right? Either way, either the child doesn't have to do what they're doing, what you told them to do, and then their resistance is what's reinforced and what is become learned behavior, or they finally do it, right? They turn off their video game, but it's only after you got to this level. You got to this level, there you go. <laughs> um, and so in that case, right, then our pushback, then our emotional and our escalation, our emotional response is what's winning. So we wanna be really careful about what's becoming learned at this point, right? Either my child is learning, hey, I only listen to mom and dad when they get up here, or they learn, I can dawdle, I can push, I can wait, I know they'll get up here, I know they'll get up here too. And eventually up here, I'll start to give in. I'll, I'll do what they want. I don't know why that doesn't go. Um, so the goal of behavioral parent training is that we're really starting to break this cycle. Okay, a child engages in problem behavior or just engages in anything, right? It could be, hey, it's time for dinner, go ahead and turn the TV off. And ideally, we're not going right towards that escalation because we have more tools in our tool belt. When we have more tools in our tool belt, we're more likely to pick something that's not going to elicit such a giant response from us or from our child. Ideally, and I'm going to talk about this a lot, we need the relationship to stay intact. Children will only listen to us when they know that we care. The number one recommendation and the best thing I can ever tell you in therapy is that you need to build the strongest possible bond with your child and in that attachment in order for them to actually listen to you. Now, that's a lot easier said than done when we are talking about really difficult behaviors. And obviously that's what I do every day, all day, <laughs> all day long. So I understand that. Um, we want to though reverse the cycle. And the thing is, these become learned behaviors over time. We don't reverse the cycle overnight. We reverse the cycle slowly. So the very first step is to pull yourself out of this coercive cycle by building a better relationship. Research tells us that young kids, one to seven years old, all they need is five minutes of our one-on-one -on -one uninterrupted time in order to start building up that bond and that attachment. Older kids, they might need 10 minutes, they might need 15 minutes, one-on-one -on -one uninterrupted time. And when I say that to parents these days, most of them tell me, that's all I do. I am not ever without my children. Um, and that's absolutely true, but you're always interrupted, right? You always have your phone next to you. You always have an email that you have to get to. You can't have uninterrupted time all throughout the day, nor is that healthy. We don't want you to. But if you can spend just five to 10 minutes, I have to make sure I can see my clock. Okay, if you can spend just five to 10 minutes of one-on-one -on -one uninterrupted time where you can focus on active listening skills, you're gonna put so much money in that bank so that when we move into, say, consequences, when we move into, hey, bud, turn off your video game and come up for dinner, kids are more likely to actually do that. So when we're doing this one-on-one -on -one time, the number one thing you can do is start praising. Praising specific positive behaviors we wanna see more of. We're gonna talk more about praising, so I won't go into too much detail, but it could be something as simple as, I love that you're sharing with me, or thanks for coming over here. We wanna focus on following a child's lead during this time. We tell our kids, what to do, what to wear, where to go to school, who their friends are, what to put in their little bodies all day long, every single day. We don't need to control their play, for instance, right? Younger kids, 10 and under, I would highly recommend doing this in the play context, right? So you get their favorite game out, you're describing what they're doing. Whoa, I see you're building a Lego tower. Ooh, you're building it really tall. I love that you're picking up the red block. Oh, I see that you're, you're uh, grabbing the green block. You're imitating their play. So you're doing what they're doing. You're praising, you're actively listening to them, okay? 
active listening and validation go hand in hand. Validation refers to validating and, and really reinforcing a child's thoughts, behaviors, and feelings, okay? Recognizing, I know it's really hard that we're in this. I know it's really hard that we're doing this. That's validation, right? I, I recognize and I'm validating your feelings. Recognizing your thoughts, right? I know that that could be really tough. I know that uh, you thought it might be a little bit easier. I know that you really wanna go play with your friends right now, right? Those are validating thoughts. It doesn't always mean we agree with them. That's very different, right? We don't necessarily agree, but we can start to validate more. That, I'm gonna do that every single time. Validation is, um, I don't know if you can hear the noise, if you can't, that's, <laughs> but um, it doesn't go with my keyboard. So we want to first and foremost, think about preparing the scene for children um, to know exactly what's coming. Kids will always feel more secure, safer when they know what to expect. So we call these positive antecedents. In the behavioral world, we always wanna focus on, well, what happened right before the behavior? What happened right before that big tantrum? An antecedent, right? That's all that is. So we want to think about, okay, what happened right before? The positive antecedents, that refers to things that we can put in place to increase the opportunity that we're gonna see an increase in positive behaviors. Something, I was just making one, but something like a visual routine. It's a great way that kids can look. They can see what's expected of them. Yes, our kids know. And it does not mean that they have the uh, planning, the working memory. It doesn't mean that they have any of the cognitive skills at this point to actually be able to understand, okay, I'm gonna go brush my teeth and then I'm gonna take my bath. All of that's gonna take about 10 minutes where I should probably go up, get off Minecraft around, right? They just simply do not have that ability. We wanna provide behavioral expectations as much as we can prior to an activity occurring. This is one of the best things that you can do when homeschooling. Write out, it's important to use whole body listening, have my materials ready, uh, ask questions in the chat when I'm confused, right? Those are three behavioral expectations we can review at the start of every single activity. At the start of every single subject, I'm gonna say them and then buddy, you can say them back to me or I'm just gonna put them up and you can look at them when you need to know what's expected, okay? It also provides a nice visual, right? If we say whole body listening or if we say, I need you to keep your eyes on the speaker, that's a great way to provide a visual, oh, remember, so you're not constantly giving verbal reminders and verbal prompts. We want to provide information when we can. What this means is simply that we give kids commands all day long. And as much as we can, we want to actually provide information and see if kids listen on their own, right? There's a lot of kids that will come to the couch when you say, um, our favorite TV show is on tonight. And then you can praise them, whoa, great job coming to the couch, I didn't even tell you. you I didn't have to call you down, right? Because you didn't, you actually didn't give them a command. All you simply said was a piece of information, our favorite TV show is on, and then they came. Our goal is always to get to that point. Um, it takes work though, and it's, and it's hard. But ultimately, we want to see how much compliance can we get just with information alone. Transition warnings are something that probably most of you do. I love transition warnings that are verbal. However, I also love transition warnings that are nonverbal or that are prompted by something else. Um, for instance, we can create a really nice association if we play the exact same song for cleanup every single day. I used to do this in schools all the time, right? I'm gonna play this exact song. The minute you hear it, you're gonna know it's time to clean up. Now, we have to work towards that association. So that does not happen overnight. What we can expect is that at first, you tell your child, oh, okay, remember it's that song. I remember we were talking about that. That was gonna be our cleanup song. All right, I'm gonna help you. We're gonna do it together. 
And then you can use those descriptions I talked about earlier, right? I see you're picking up the blocks. You're putting them in the box. If you need to give a command, and we'll talk a little bit more about commands in a minute, but if you do need to give a command, remember that they're short, they're bite-sized, they're sweet and simple. I know I'm talking fast because we have a lot to go through. Um, but, you know, instead of coming into a room and saying, hey, buddy, clean up this room, the kid's going to look at you and think, absolutely not. Or they're going to throw a tantrum just to avoid it. And that probably will work. So instead of saying something like that, we want to break it down for them. Hey, bud, put these blocks into this box. Put this game away. That's all I need you to do right now. Uh, transition warnings in any kind are great. One of my favorite tools, I probably pick this up every single day, either for myself in session or to show a parent, is the time timer. Uh, they are off of Amazon, shockingly expensive for a teeny tiny little timer, but they're simple, right? They turn red when we're putting it on. We can very clearly see how many minutes the child has left, or how many seconds, rather. Um, very simple. Okay, so time timer, anything along those lines, but anything to provide a transition warning. We also want to plan ahead. Expect that this isn't going to be smooth all the time. Whenever I'm working with parents, I tell them we're shooting for 80% compliance. You do not have, as adults, you do not have 100% every single day. You don't give 100% every day. You can't, you're human. Same with our kids, right? So if we have a behavior plan in place at school, I'm expecting four of those days to be great. They're gonna meet their goal. One day, they're probably gonna go haywire and they're not gonna meet their goal, but that's expected. When we expect those things, our expectations are leveled off so that we feel better about them, right? We expect it, we know it's coming. That way it's not a surprise or a punch to the gut. Right, because sometimes we can feel such failure if things are going really well and then we have one really rough day. But in reality, that's not failure. That's actually really great success. That's called behavioral shaping. Um, alrighty, so I referenced this a little bit before, but this just simply refers to how to model positive behaviors. Remember, the biggest thing that you can do is to talk through your stressful moments. Um, I have given out more feelings wheels during this pandemic than I ever have in my entire career, making sure that you're learning different feelings, right? Kids work under the umbrella of the five primary emotions, right? I'm happy, I'm mad, I'm sad, I'm scared, and I'm disgusted. There are hundreds of other feelings. And we want to teach them that every feeling is okay, even if it feels uncomfortable. We're never working to minimize feelings or to make them go away, we're working to tolerate them, okay? Big, big difference. Even when I treat anxiety, we're never, we're, our goal is never for the anxiety to decrease. It is simply to learn, how can I tolerate this anxiety? How can I tolerate how uncomfortable this feels in my body? Okay. Um, we want to make sure that we're, again, providing encouragement in their emotional development by helping them learn these coping skills. Think about practicing this again when you're calm, when you're relaxed. All righty, so one of the core pieces of any kind of behavioral work we do is learning how to redirect our attention. What we know is that our attention can be entirely powerful. If we pay attention to negative behaviors, those negative behaviors are gonna increase. If we pay attention to positive behaviors, those positive behaviors are gonna increase, okay? We wanna really think about where am I delivering my attention? My attention means anything. It means my eye contact, my verbalizations, what am I saying, my tone, it's a big one. Um, it means my, uh, my face, right? Like many parents will say, well, I just give them a face and they know. They probably know, but you're still giving a little dose of attention, right? You're still giving something to that bad behavior. And we're never ever working to ignore the child. We're working to better direct our attention. So we're going to increase positive behavior. That's always the goal here. Okay, so we're human, right? We're programmed to fix things. We're programmed to want to fix problems. 
when I see a child arguing with another child, my goal and my hunch is to jump in there and want to fix it. But in reality, I know one that might increase the likelihood of that child arguing again, two, because I'm paying attention to it. Two, I'm also missing and losing an opportunity for children to actually work through conflict resolution on their own, right? We don't want to pay attention right when a behavior is occurring. And I'm talking minor misbehaviors, okay? We're gonna talk more about this skill in a little bit. We want to attend and provide a ton of attention to positive behaviors, okay? Meaning as we see behaviors, we wanna be on the lookout for them, right? If I know that my child struggles by having tantrums regularly, I'm gonna catch every single moment I can to praise them for having a calm body. And it feels silly, don't get me wrong, because if they're sitting on the couch, it feels really silly to say, oh, great job having a nice calm body over there. I see that, right? Because of course they're sitting on the couch, you're thinking, or of course they have a calm body on the couch, you're thinking, oh, great, I'm gonna go run over and, you know, stir my pasta. <laughs> but in reality, we actually wanna focus on those more moments more than anything else, right? If they started whining, you're more likely to go over to them. But actually we need to flip it. We need to flip it so that you are paying attention. You're walking over in those moments of calm, praising positive behaviors. You start to ignore the, the whining and the minor misbehaviors. Again, we're gonna talk more about that. Uh oh, um, alrighty. So we always wanna think about what is the function behind the behavior? The function refers to how does this behavior sustain itself? How does it thrive? We follow a SEAT acronym here, S-E-A-T. Okay, sensory, it feels really good, it's enjoyable. Uh, this could be jumping on the couch, for instance, right? I'm not doing it because anybody's watching me. I'm doing it because it feels good. Escape or avoidance, right? I'm trying to get out of something. A great example of this one is the minute I get a math test in class, I have a tummy ache. I have to go to the, I have to go to the bathroom, right? I have to go to the nurse. I'm pretty sure I was that kid, right? I'm trying to leave something. This is a tricky one, right? We see this a lot during bedtime. I'm trying to avoid going to bedtime or I'm trying to avoid the separation of bedtime even. So mommy, just one more book. I need one more book. Attention. I'm trying to gain interactions or attention. Keep in mind, kids at a very young age, most of the kids that you, had, you uh, all noted having, right? Those elementary age and younger, Kids at this age, they really don't understand that they can get more attention from positive behavior than they can from negative behavior. We need to help them understand that. Attention is attention is attention for kids. They don't care how they get it. They don't care that it comes from whining or if it comes from coming over and giving you a big giant soft hug. So we're helping to shape that. We're helping them understand, whoa, look, you get so much more of mom and dad's attention when you're calm, when you speak to me kindly, when you're, when you're uh, calm with your brother, right? When you're gentle with your baby sister. The fourth one is tangible. I'm trying to actually get something for this. So I know that the grocery store is so embarrassing. So I know if I scream loud enough, I'm going to eventually get that candy bar that I want, right? I know how to get what I want. And it's not manipulation. I also want to point that out. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. The defining behaviors piece I actually uh, didn't touch on, but this is important, right? As adults, we tend to actually use very vague terms to define behavior. Uh, I, I've seen so many good girl or good boy charts, and really that's not telling our children anything because often I'll go up to a child and say, what does it mean to be a good boy? And they'll say, I don't know, be good, right? It gives us nothing. So instead we actually wanna break that down for them. What does it mean to be good? And again, if you have an off day, it doesn't necessarily mean you're bad. So I don't really love that to begin with, right? But we wanna break it down more. So it means we have a calm and safe body. This is what a safe body looks like. Let's role play it. Let's look, let's like actually act it out. It means, asking for things calmly, right? We're working through the definition for our children. We want to make sure if I put a, a behavior on a behavior chart, or if I praise the behavior out loud, a stranger would know exactly what I'm talking about. 
that definition is the same as it is to me as it is to Dr. Mandy, right? It's exactly the same across all people or the majority at least, right? So I know exactly what it looks like to have safe feet and hands, right? Um, so praising and reinforcing positive behavior. These are our pride skills. This is one of uh, the tips and the tricks that we teach parents that do PCIT or parent-child interaction therapy. Uh, we use a pride acronym here. So praise means actually specific labeled praise. Think about it. We are way more likely to work on a curriculum if our boss came over and said, whoa, I love that curriculum and how you designed it. It was so amazing and there was so much information in there, right? You're much more likely to think about the next time you work on that curriculum. Same with kids. I love how nicely you're sitting in your chair during mealtime. I see your bottoms on the, on the bottom of the chair, your feet are on the floor. You're praising very specific behaviors. Keep in mind, you're praising the behaviors you wanna see more of. We're also working to build up that attachment, that bond, that relationship we talked about being so important. Reflections refer to repeating back verbalizations for kids. These are the skills I want you to use during that five to 10 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time. If your child says to you, I wanna play with the blocks today. Oh, you wanna play with the blocks? You're not asking a question. You're not giving a command. You're simply just repeating back language. You're doing it in a way that it doesn't turn into a question too, right? You wanna play with blocks? That would be a question. We wanna work our way backwards from, again, controlling the situation. We want to just reflect, repeat back, use our active listening skills. Descriptions refer to describing behavior. This is a key, key ingredient for kiddos with ADHD and focus and attention issues, right? If you're describing what they're doing, oh, I see you're picking up your pencil, you're putting it on the paper, you're drawing, you're, you're writing your name. They're actually far more likely to stay focused and attentive, attentive on that work if you weren't doing that sounds crazy to us, right? It feels actually very distracting for us to do that. Um, but for kids, it actually helps them focus and keep that attention. In play, right? I see you're putting the block up here. I see you're moving it over here. Description and enjoyment simply refer to having fun, enjoying it. Kids can always tell when you're acting a little off if you're trying to recite or, or you, you wrote, I've had a lot of parents write pride on their hand. That's cheating, by the way. But right, right, if you're right, trying to remember, what is that I? Um, so just try to have fun with it. It's always going to feel more natural if you're enjoying it, playing, actually imitating, doing it. The amount of times I've picked up my walkie-talkie or, or talked into Zoom in this case, right, where I'm saying, pick up the block, dad pick up the block dad and go ahead and build the tower, right? You wanna actually be in the play. That's the only way this is gonna feel good. So we wanna make sure that praise is super, super specific. I cannot stress that enough. We also wanna drop the negatives. So if I were to tell a child, oh, great job not jumping on the couch or great job not running, guess what? All they're hearing is running. They have a recency effect. They're gonna hear the very last words that we say. So instead, we wanna drop all of those negatives and just focus on the positive. Great job using your walking feet. I love that you're so calm around the house. You wanna be physically close and use this at a very high frequency. We always say three to five to one, right? Three or five praises for every one constructive feedback. Active or planned ignoring, this refers to the intentional withdrawal of attention for minor misbehaviors. I will say at this point, we're really getting into some of the meat of behavioral parent training. A lot of these skills are tricky. Um, I work with parents on these skills for weeks or months at a time. These are skills that can feel really hard to implement on your own. That's where, just like Mandy said, right? If you need any additional support, you want any live coaching, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. While a lot of these concepts, as I'm speeding through them, feel simple, they're really actually complex. And if we do just one wrong thing, sometimes things can go awry and then you say this didn't work. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're, as, you're, as you're kind of going through these things in your head of what might happen. I've been through all scenarios. So again, you might just need a little additional support. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, so we withdraw our attention for those minor misbehaviors. What I mean by that are tantrums, whining, arguing, but the active part of active ignoring is that we're withdrawing our attention, meaning we're not giving any attention, whether that's verbal or nonverbal, we're doing nothing, but we are very clearly waiting to see the positive opposite behavior occur. If we do not follow through with a praise at the end of that ignoring, this isn't gonna ever work. You're just simply ignoring. Um, as an example, right, if you had a child who was tantruming and you knew it was attention seeking behavior, you knew they just wanted your attention. You didn't understand why, because you just spent the whole day at home working from home around that child all day long. You ignore the behavior, you turn around, you keep cooking, but you always have one, one eye out on the child. And then as soon as you hear any sign of calm, any, right, or just even like any breath, anything that you can, you go ahead and you praise that behavior. Whoa, buddy, I love that you're calming down. Thanks so much for calming your body. Okay, we wanna make sure that we're always praising it. And you can even say, I love that you're calm. Buddy, now that you're calm, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Oh, you wanna go play? Okay, and then you practice hitting the reset button so that you can, you can model that for them as well. Again, all easier said than done. This is why I literally do this all day long with, with parents. Um, so again, keep that in mind. It's always gonna be easier said. When we're doing this, we wanna prepare for an extinction burst. An extinction burst simply refers to the fact that if we've attended to a behavior for a long time, say we've always attended when a child is whining or tantruming or arguing, we are going to see a child cycle through all different kinds of behaviors in order to get that attention that they're desiring, right? Meaning if I start ignoring whining, you might see it start to increase it might go up, right? It might kind of, we might ride the wave up and at the top of the wave, it starts being tantruming or it starts, I'm picking up my book and I'm, you know, tossing it across the room. We're going to see that behavior increase. If we give in up here, we're going to see that go up there a lot quicker. So we want to make sure we're prepared to ride out this extinction burst and ride out this wave of bad behavior. This is really important. And again, all the more important to sometimes do this with somebody that can kind of coach you through it. One thing to note, I saw we had a lot of parents of toddlers in the, uh, in the group today. One thing to note is that a lot of toddlers are not doing behaviors that are toddler-like for attention. A lot of times they actually truly don't have the emotional development to know that what they're doing is wrong. Um, and so it's not necessarily that they're seeking our attention, but it's more just that they're emotionally dysregulated because they're little little humans that don't really understand what's going on in the world. So for a toddler and for, again, children developmentally under two years old um, or really, you know, one and a half and under, we want to make sure that we're helping them with their emotional development. So we might be doing something like, oh, it's really frustrating when your toy breaks and then you're helping them to distract their, their body, right? Distraction is one of the biggest behavioral tools we use at that age, right? You might pick them up, turn them to, towards a new toy, put on this new toy, especially if it has lights and it glows and it has sounds. And then, you know, uh, oh, I see your smile is coming out. I see you're calming your body down. I love that you're playing with this new toy, right? Then you're going through all of the praises. Um, but just keep in mind that we do ignore for toddlers just in a smaller way. Um, and again, that's a little bit trickier. So I'm happy to talk to talk to the families of toddlers a little bit more offline. Um, and if you do believe the behavior from a little one is still attention seeking, certainly uh, go, go about this route of active ignoring. Um, but sometimes they just actually need help kind of understanding why they're so frustrated and they don't really understand it either. So sometimes labeling and validating those feelings for them actually goes a lot longer than it does for older kids. Keep, keep in mind that for older kids too, we are never letting them get away with that behavior. That's never what we're trying to do. What we're showing them though is that I, I, can't, I can't really attend to this, right? I really can't pay a ton of attention when you're screaming at me. Um, 
we do want to, and I like to say like strike when the iron's cold, right? We want to wait until the iron is cooled off because if we try to touch it, we're going to get burned. We want to wait until that iron is cool off. And then we want to come in and we want to talk to a child when they're calm, when they're easy, when they're a little bit easier to go through problem solving, right? I know that was really frustrating for you when I told you to turn off your video game. I know, I know you wish you could have kept playing. And we're gonna have to do that every night for dinner. So how can we come up with a solution? You can come up with some ideas. I'll come up with some ideas. We'll try to come together with what might be the best one. Yeah, you could punch me in the face. I don't think that's gonna make your problem a little bigger though, right? Try to work through even crazy solutions that a child might come up with. Um, so we're not ignoring the behavior. We're not losing out on those good parent parental teaching moments. We're just making sure that we're doing them when a child can engage with us. We wanna give kids the same respect that we would want, right? I know if I'm really frustrated or upset, if somebody's trying to come over and talk to me, everything they say is gonna go in one ear out the other because I'm gonna be frustrated. I'm so stuck in my own feelings and my own emotions. Hopefully again, because I'm an adult, I'll start tuning into some of those coping strategies, but really more than anything, I need space. Kids are no different. So we wanna give them that respect. All right. Please forgive me for how fast I'm talking. I know how much we have to get through. We don't have that much time. All right, effective direction simply refers to we want to tell a kid what to do. We don't want to ask them, right? We're going to get a higher likelihood of compliance just simply by saying, please come sit in your chair rather than, can you come sit in your chair? Right, that second one had a little bit of a question at the end, right? It was an option. He didn't have to come. He was choosing whether or not he wanted to. We wanna make sure that our commands are direct, they're positive, they're specific, they're one at a time. We want to also make sure that we're breaking down tasks for kids, right? We wanna say something like, uh, we have a lot of dishes to do, please put the silverware into the dishwasher, right? Something that's really broken down and specific. Oh, it's windy outside. Um, so we also want to make sure anytime we see compliance, we're praising for compliance. So always praising with for listening, not necessarily the task, right? We're not always saying, great job putting the dishes in the dishwasher. We're saying, thanks for listening. Thanks for helping, right? Think about those pro-social skills we want to harness in our kids. I love that you're helping the family. You're doing such a good job pitching in. This is an effective direction, the steps, right? We want to make sure we're giving information before the direction or after compliance. What we tend to do is give a direction. Hey buddy, uh, please uh, put these blocks away. And then we give a lot of information. Well, it, most of the time it's because they're asking questions, right? It's very logical, it makes a lot of sense, right? Well, why? Is it, is it time for dinner? And then you're giving answers and then 10 minutes has gone, have gone by and there's no blocks put away. And you also forget what you even told him to do in the first place and certainly he did. All right, and then afterwards, we're gonna always praise for listening. Okay. Um, so we're getting to the good steps. So behavior plans, behavior plans, as I said before, as I said about a lot of these skills, especially towards the end of this presentation, they are simple yet complex. Behavior plans need to be tweaked typically by somebody like me, somebody that can kind of help you really learn how to target those specific behaviors. We wanna make sure that behavior plans are extremely specific for our kiddos and also set them up for success. I'm gonna actually pop over to the next slide real quick so you can see a good classic example. This is a behavior plan for a five-year-old plus. So this could be used for kids 12 years old, 15 years old. Um, probably not with the tie dye. Well, maybe actually, I think this was for a 14 year old. It also had pictures of TikTok stars, but I took them off because I don't know who's popular anymore. Um, we're gonna go back to the other one in a second. So one to three positively framed behaviors. This might be listen within one morning. This might be keep a calm and safe body during dinner time, because we already know that that's really hard. We wanna include behaviors that are specific yet broad enough, and this is the tricky part, right? Broad enough where we have a lot of opportunities to reinforce, right? Listen within one warning is something I almost always put on a behavior chart because we have tons of opportunity to reinforce that type of behavior. Great job listening by putting your books away. 
good job listening. I saw you, 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 you know, took your water bottle out of your backpack. Whenever kids have some piece of them on the chart, they're more likely to be intrigued and, and use it, right? So putting on Minecraft characters, Roblox characters, whatever it might be. A rewards list of anywhere from five to eight rewards that a child can cash in for. Admittedly, this is a very tricky time for rewards um, because I really like to balance them with social rewards and experiential rewards and tangibles, right? So for every LOL doll I have on a reward chart, I also want extra special playtime with mom or picking out what we eat for dinner or a visit to the my favorite store or a, a walk to the toy store. Some of these things are difficult right now. So we have to be extra creative. For five plus year olds, I like to cash in at least two times a week. Um, for, more, for younger children, I like to cash in uh, typically daily. Um, for older kids, right, like a four to five year old, sometimes I might do every other day. You cannot have a good behavior chart where a child is not cashing in frequently or the goals are too high that it's taking them months for them to cash in or months for them to, you know, get their reward or their reinforcement. What we're doing here is creating a system where we're providing them extrinsic reinforcement, right? We're providing them rewards to build up their intr intrinsic motivation, right? We know we want the kids to take, the, take their plates to the sink because they want to and they should just do it and they're not. So let's figure out a system where we can teach them how to do it. We can build up the fact that, hey, it, it kind of does feel good to do my part, or at the very least, it feels good to get praise from mom and dad every time I do this. So we always wanna pair a positive behavior on a behavior chart with a uh, praise, with a verbal praise or a, a, a nonverbal if you need to, right? But well, I really love that you listened, great job, right? Something as simple as that. We want to review a child's success at least every day, at least once a day, right? I'm gonna review with you how many points you got. You got 20 points. You're so close to earning that Roblox, Roblox gift card for uh, 60 points. I know you can do it. I believe in you. When we're providing those two E's of empathy and encouragement, I know it's really hard and I also know that you can do it we're gonna see improvement, we're gonna see behavior change. Again, our goal is 75 to 80% compliance every single time. We are not going to strive for 100%. If we strive for 100%, we're going to fail. Um, and ultimately our child's gonna fail and we certainly don't want that to happen. We need to do behavioral shaping that's very slow and gradual, right? Something as simple as, it's a great example, I was just thinking about this, right? And my sleep chart. So for a small child, every single day, they get a reward. Every day I color in a big picture of a Superman or of a, of a whatever, whatever they are, um, of a superhero rather, I get a small reward, a daily reward. If I have three in a row, whoa, I get a big reward. A small reward might be a Hershey kiss. A big reward might be 10 minutes of my game or 10 minutes of a YouTube video, right? Again, we're not talking extravagant $100. We're talking very simple rewards to really build up how they feel and their confidence around certain behaviors because they're an issue, okay? We're not gonna send kids to, behave, to college with behavior charts. We're targeting behaviors until we see a high enough compliance rate, then we swap them out. I love when I start a behavior chart with, you know, keeping a calm or safe body around my little sister and then the behavior I swap out is make my bed or something silly, right? Because we got to that point. We can now focus on these more minor misbeh or more minor behaviors. Um, one note, because I was actually just talking about it today, the, uh, the system for sleeping can be really tricky. It's one that I work with parents a ton on, right? So a uh, red light, green light system, I'm sure you all have heard about that, right? Where the clock turns green, that signals a child to come out of their room. When we are making these systems, we wanna make sure that we're actually working where the child is. Say a child's getting up at 6 a.m. every morning, but you want them to sleep until seven. And so you set the green light to turn on at seven, they're still gonna come out of their bed at six o'clock every morning because we actually need to move all the way backwards 
put the green clock, let's put the clock on, so it's cut turn green at 6.05. Once we see 6.05, he's mastering 6.05, let's move it up to 6.10, right? We're gradually shaping that behavior. That's how we get consistent behavior change. That's how we get success. Again, five or six nights out of the week, it's not gonna be perfect. This is a great example of a behavior chart for a slightly older child, right? Use kind language, do my homework, listen within one morning. Every time I do this, I have a little tally mark over here. Once I go down, right, I have say 30 points, 30 tallies. Um, on my point sheet, I have five to eight rewards, but they're all grad or they're all uh, different values. So perhaps I have a 15 pointer, uh, which is really simple, really little. And then I also have something that's 300 points. This is also a nice system because what we're doing is we're helping kids learn, okay, I could save my money. I could save my money and I can wait and cash in on something really big, or I can wait, I can hold off a little bit and then I can just kind of cash in, uh, you know, or, or whatever, right? I can cash in more frequently or I can hold off and save. So we're also helping to teach that concept of actually saving their money. Okay, wow, I don't think I've ever done that in this time. Um, last time I went way over, so I'm trying to go, go, uh, go faster, but I know y'all probably have to rewatch all of this because that was very quick. Compassionate self-care is one that I keep at the end of ev almost every single slide deck I do, almost every training I do for parents and for teachers for that matter. Um, it is, we never get enough time on it. And I think that that's very, uh, very similar to just self-care in general. Remember that for kids, we truly cannot take care of them if we are not filling up our oxygen tank first, right? We, just like in a plane, right? They tell you, put your mask on first before you help the person next to you. It's exactly the same you are probably experiencing as parents or as caregivers, a lot of conflicting feelings, especially right now. You love being home with your kiddo because you get to see their development. You get to see them in different ways. You get to see all of these milestones that would have occurred in daycare and you're drained and you're exhausted because they don't go to mom like they go to dad or they can't separate now. They're having separation anxiety at nighttime, right? Whatever it might be. Um, we want to really, again, try our best to focus on ourselves when we can. Reconnecting with activities that you know you once enjoyed. Having a system where you're tapping out, right? Tapping out your spouse or your partner if you have one. Um, making sure that you're having those hard conversations. And that's what I've had a lot of with families this during this time, right? You're having those hard conversations of this is really difficult and I need support, how can we get support, right? It might be tapping in and out your partner, right? Making sure that they know your signal so that when you need a break, you can very easily kind of let them know. Um, we want to practice empathetic parenting as much as possible, which really just refers to validating both your feelings and your child's feelings. You cannot be everything. And we want to, we have to, <laughs> at this point, truly minimize and manage our own expectations. You can't be a 100% home teacher while being 100% full-time at your job, while being a 100% teacher for, you know, kindergarten and second grade and fifth grade. It's not humanly possible. And so kids can't expect that. We Or rather, we wouldn't expect that from kids and we certainly can from ourselves as well. Also make note of how much news and media you're consuming and also keeping our kids up to date. Um, one of the biggest things I've had to share with parents recently is uh, maybe not super recently in the last month or so that, you know, COVID did get better. We did have a, a period of cases that were very low that we were okay. Um, we tend to, again, just like we do with behavior, we tend to focus on the negative. And so we tend to hyper-focus when things are really bad and really traumatic. And our kids hear that they pick up on it. They see that the TV is on all the time on the news. And yet we don't always do that when things are going a little better. And so we always have to remind ourselves, when's the last time I talked to my child about COVID and what's going on? 
right? Do they remember it in as March in New York City? Because they probably do if you haven't really talked to them about it, especially the younger ones. Um, so we want to make sure that we're kind of keeping them, oh, uh, keeping them filled in, right, on what's going on to a developmentally appropriate level. And again, this is something I've talked to a lot of parents about. We're more than happy to have just kind of one-off conversations about if you need to do need some support around just how to have those conversations, um, we can certainly, certainly do that and support with that at Small Brooklyn. Coping thoughts are one uh, amazing thing that you can also generate with your child right now, right? Coming up with, let's list out a couple of coping thoughts. This really stinks and we know that we're gonna be okay. We know that there's an end coming. We know that there's a vaccine. Let's look at all the people that have gotten vaccinated. Again, it's only been a couple of days, but right, let's look at the facts. Let's try to challenge some of those more negative and really unhelpful cognitions. So if you're thinking about behavioral work, we want to focus gradually. If you go home and you, or you are home, but if you, uh, if you try to implement all of these strategies that I just talked about very quickly in this last 60 minutes, you're going to fail. So instead, what I would recommend is, well, I shouldn't predict failure, but that's going to be really hard. I know I certainly couldn't do it as a parent. So instead, what we want to do is take bite-sized amounts to work on per week. So for instance, right, for the next two weeks, focus on, I'm going to praise these behaviors. I'm going to come up with a list. I'm going to list out five positive behaviors. Remember, they always have to be positive, right? Usually they're the opposite of the negative. So if I hate my child's whining and my child's screaming, I'm going to catch every moment that they ask me something kindly. And I'm going to catch every moment that they speak nicely or use an indoor voice. Maybe I'll put up a visual of a volume scale too for them to reference. Right, these are the numbers, right? We speak in a level two or a level one. These are the, le the levels that we speak in, in the house, indoors. I'm gonna catch every time they're at a level one or a level two. If you Google volume scale, it's super easy to find too. Um, I'm gonna work on beginning to actively ignore some of the minor misbehaviors. So the opposite of what I'm praising, I'm gonna start to ignore it. You do that for two to three weeks, you're going you're doing it consistently, you're going to start to see some decrease in those attention-seeking behaviors. Again, mostly for those attention-seeking behaviors. After two weeks, if you're still not seeing too much progress or if you want to add on another layer of um, intervention here, define one to three behaviors and then come up with a rewards list. Again, I'm happy to provide a lot of these things. I'm happy to help you with generating these things. The aggressive behaviors, we really didn't talk a lot about. And there's a reason for that because consequences are really difficult. We've touched on the positive reinforcement. Um, and then look at that, that took 60 minutes. And quite frankly, it usually takes a couple sessions. Uh, the consequences for aggressive behavior, we really need to work on to make sure that we're applying them appropriately. Um, and that's just the truth, right? They can be really tricky. Time out, loss of privilege, taking something away. We need to do that in very small increments. What we know is if we do that, it will, what, what, well, truly what we know is that consequences are the least effective behavior management skill in terms of everything else. Consequences are at the very tippy top of our pyramid because they don't do too much. What does a lot are all the things that we just discussed. So really, we can get to consequences, but let's make sure we're doing everything else before that. And again, that's where I come in if you need help. So again, I always recommend that kids and families are um, experiencing therapy with an evidence-based therapist. Evidence-based therapy has a lot of research and backing to support it. Um, parent management training and PCIT is one that I am trained in. Um, PCIT refers to the live coaching aspect that Mandy had described earlier. It's crazy effective treatment. We do it for toddlers. We also do it for kids two to seven years old. I also implement it in my PMT training quite often. So again, we use that quite often because if I can live coach you in that moment, your learning is going to happen much quicker than if I told you and told you, okay, now you go, you go apply this, you go do this, right? You're going to think, what did she say? Or how am I supposed to say that? It doesn't matter how well I explain it. Um, individual treatment. So CBT is something we use for our internalizers. Internalizers refer to kids with anxiety and depression. 
Um, we usually start CBT at seven, so seven plus. We do that because it's a very cognitive model, right? We are, in any individual treatment, really we truly do begin at around seven years old because we wanna make sure that the child can actually reflect back on some of their experiences, that they're able to recognize both their thoughts, their feelings and their behaviors. And truly kids earlier than that, they have a really hard time with it. Um, we do do coping skills. I do a lot of coping skills with kids younger than seven but I do them a lot with parents in tandem because again, we're always gonna to have to practice these things outside of stressful situations. So what's gonna be most helpful is actually if I teach a child and a parent together, let's do some deep breathing exercises or let's generate coping skills. Okay, now I want you to go practice that tomorrow at 3 p.m. when they come home from school and I want you to lie in bed and recite your coping skills. Right? We want to make sure that we're practicing again through those less stressful days. Oh, less stressful moments, sorry. Here's a list of incredible resources. Um, so these are some of the resources that I use. There are also a lot of the resources that I recommend to parents. The Everyday Parenting Toolkit is a great one um, that is very similar to everything that I just described. Taking charge of ADHD is a good one for kids with ADHD. Um, and then... Ah, uh, the Fred Frankel one is very good for uh, generating pro-social skills. Um, again, these are all things that we are more than happy to support you with. You're, you can find my email directly right on that front page. This is also our general email on this page to contact us, set up a, a quick one-time consultation or look for more support. We are here throughout your child's entire development from the itty bitties all the way through teenage years as much as we can. All right, that was that was quick, but Mandy, I know we have probably some good questions if we have time for them. <laughs> we have so many questions, um, which is just really awesome. And uh, and by the way, so much amazing information. I feel like we I am, I we need to slow mo that or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we probably need to lengthen the the length of this talk. Maybe exactly. we should be targeting ninety minutes, one hundred and twenty minutes instead of an hour. That's so right. I apologize that we're already over and. Um, but I do want to get some of these questions in. So if you can stick around, feel free or check in on the recording when I send it out tomorrow sometime. Um, but uh, I, I'm sure I'm not gonna, we're definitely not gonna be able to get to all these questions. So I really apologize if we can't get to your specific question, feel free to reach out to Jill or me for, um, for more help on a specific question. So let's talk more about um, maybe themes. So one of the things that I heard from a few people is, do these strategies work for older kids, tweens, teens, spouses? I was just going to say that. Yes, absolutely. They work for <laughs> every human. Absolutely. Definitely. So they definitely work throughout the throughout a child's development. What we want to tweak is really our tone as kids get older. Um, and quite honestly, I have to tweak my tone quite a bit for younger kids too, right? For our uh, seven-year-olds that think they're going on 17, right? We want to just become a little bit more neutral, a little bit more unlabeled, right? You can say like, oh, nice work and use a non-verbal too so they know exactly what you're talking about but absolutely we want to use these skills across a child's entire development that special time that one-on-one -on -one time i reference again the biggest bang for your buck in therapy is going to be that recommendation that's true mm -hmm. for all ages because if kids awesome. know that you care they're going to care to listen to you awesome and then, so how you, you did talk a little bit in the talk about uh, toddlers and babies and some of the things that you might do a little bit differently. Is there anything else that maybe is more applicable for that age? The really itty bitties, as you said? Yeah, so if we're using active ignoring for a toddler, so say, and we actually will use it for more aggressive behaviors. Um, so mm -hmm. for instance, if a child is hitting, right? Again, it's not because they're necessarily a toddler because it's not necessarily because they're seeking your attention. It's also not because they're looking to hurt you or any other, any other reason, right? They just don't know what to do with their big feelings. They just have big feelings right. and they don't know how to handle them. So the way that we actually use active ignoring with toddlers is to actually cup their hands, kind of like a hand over hand gesture, but we're really cupping their hands and we say no hitting. And then we look away and then we say gentle hands 
This is an example for hitting. There's a lot of different examples. And then we go gentle hands. We look back. So we actually lose our gaze. We active, actively ignore for three seconds. So three seconds is all that little babies wow. need. We go back to their eye contact. We say gentle hands. And then if you can, and again, you can't always, if you can, so you model it, but then you just hand over hands, right? You're grabbing their hand, big, big skill for, for little babies. And then say they, I don't have any toys near me for once, but right. Then you just kind of grab their toy and you say gentle hands and you, you kind of show them what that looks like. Okay. Um, and then you praise them. Awesome. Wow. Great job having gentle hands. I love those gentle hands. Your tone, your affect is going to go a long way with babies. Um, mm -hmm. And the same goes for, again, that distraction skill, right? If we can just kind of scoop them up and turn them over this way and make a really big deal of, you know, the new toy, that type of distraction works really well. But what you want to make sure you're doing is labeling a lot of their feelings at that age. Um, by labeling those feelings, right? Oh, it's so frustrating when your toy breaks or... Oh, I know, I, I get so mad when that happens, right? You're helping in their emotional development. Very and keep cool. in mind, they're not doing it to seek your attention or seek bad attention. They just truly don't know what to do with these feelings. Or to manipulate the situation or any of that. I do feel like we attribute a lot of those grown up uh, sorts of uh, reasons. Of, yeah. Definitely. One of the most interesting things to me is that our toddler adaptations, like our toddler protocols or interventions that we do are the only ones, well, not the only one, but one of the main parent intervention that talks about yeah. CBT for parents. So only in toddler oh, work, yeah. do we ever come across coping skills yeah. for parents, uh, relaxation for parents, changing those negative cognitions, because we see that so much in toddlers because it's so confusing. Why are they so mad all the time? Why are they angry? Why, why are they screaming at the door because they can't walk through the door, right? None of their behaviors make sense. That actually happened recently, but none of their behaviors make sense, right? So it's so frustrating. And I definitely need to combat some of those distorted cognitions for my older kids. So, um, you know, this is one of the reasons that we as a practice really try and incorporate parents into even individual therapy with kids as much as we do, because, you know, kids even up through teenager years are still, you're still a very active part of their life and, you know, need to be involved in it and, and, and addressing some of your own distorted thoughts. Um, that's a really good point. So let's talk more about the aggressive behavior you were just mentioning with uh, toddlers, but I mean, for like all ages, I know you said uh, dealing with consequences is one of the ways that we deal with aggression um, and, and really need, I think people would do well to get extra help with that. When you're talking about maybe minor, more minor acts of aggression or uh, destruction that's happening in the moment, when you can't really stop and ignore them because you need them to stop doing what they're doing right then, what's the best way to handle that in the moment? So number one, you want to try to manipulate the environment as much as you can. If they're not hurting you or themselves, try to remove what you can that they're hurting, right? If they're, again, toss in a book over, try to remove the objects. Now, 99% of the time, it's going to be impossible in New York City homes. <laughs> um, so right. that's probably not helpful, but... <laughs> That would be number one. But number two is, so anytime you can do that, please do that. Because again, that's reducing the attention. Um, but number two is that if we give a consequence, because we certainly can, we want to make sure that consequences are given only for major behaviors that can't be ignored. And we want to make sure that we're previewing it with children ahead of time. So you're saying, okay, we're going to start time out for hurting. What does hurting look like? Does it look like this or does it look like this, right? We're role playing and acting through exactly what a specific behavior looks like so that they're not surprised by it. And in that, if we are giving a consequence, we wanna make sure that it's short, it's sweet, it's to the point, and we're still actively ignoring, right? One of the biggest reasons timeouts don't work or parents say timeouts don't work is because they tend to still be giving kids a lot of attention in the timeout. And we actually need to pair a consequence with still a loss of attention because that's the real consequence if you think about it. Um, but you absolutely should be giving consequences for those types of behaviors. 
but really you shouldn't give more than one a day if that. If you're giving more than five consequences a week, you really probably could be doing a couple other things that we could target, right? If you're giving the time out five times a week, there's usually something else that we can tweak. Because consequences are very mild, ultimately. They're one of our most mild uh, behavioral strategies that we have. They, they stop the behavior pretty immediately, but they don't necessarily create a lot of long-term change, mm -hmm. which is very different than what we think, right? We think, oh, they've learned, they're thinking in the timeout chair, they're really contemplating, they're not, they're thinking about their next Minecraft game, right? Or what they're eating for dinner. <laughs> oh, why am I sitting here at the board, <laughs> right? <laughs> really good point. <laughs> um, so, Obviously, the quarantine has been really hard on a lot of parents and kids. Um, what tips do you have for helping to manage virtual school? That, of course, is a big problem that a lot of parents have asked about, um, especially the younger kids who are used to being in person. Yeah. So I would say we should not expect a high level of attention throughout the day. Um, I, my number one advice is to manage your own expectations. We, if you think about it, we have tons of transition points throughout the day at regular school, right? Kids are moving from room to room. They're, pick, they're getting up, they're putting on their jackets, they're going to recess, they're running around, they're going to the bathroom, they're going from the rug to their desk. You simply don't have that at home. So they're already exerting more energy and really they're not Truly, they're really not being asked, especially younger kids, not being asked to focus on something for longer than about 10 to 12 minutes at a time, which is appropriate. And so for homeschool, we want to actually try to replicate that as much as we can. But it's tough because that's not necessarily how we're getting set up. Right. But what I would say is try to figure out how long can my child attend to something and then how can I create a schedule that breaks up their day more? Right? Am I gonna do go do a go noodle in the middle of this, or am I gonna go for a walk in the middle of this? How can we break up the schedule so it's not so jam packed? Mm -hmm. Also, quite frankly, one of my biggest uh, recommendations to parents is to talk to teachers about what really needs to get done. Because again, mm -hmm. if you're a full time working parent, you're not gonna be able to do it all, especially for kids that just need more support. So have have that honest conversation. I've never had teachers say, oh no, it all needs to get done. They say, here are the <laughs> subjects you should show up for. The other ones, we don't care if your kid's here or not. Um, most of the time, that tends to be the answer. So creating a schedule that really does work as best it can for you. And at the end of the day, all of our kids, a lot of our kids are in very similar boats. So we know, I think a lot of teachers and administrators know there's going to be a lot of catch up next year. And that's just truly what it is. Um, the behavior expectations I ran through earlier, those are very helpful for um, academics. Also, the descriptions, again, it's simply as, as silly as it sounds, describing a child working will help keep their focus and their attention, the visual schedules too. So for homeschool, positive antecedent route is where you want to go. You want to think about how can I one, make this setting look like what my child's school looks like in terms of a limited amount of distractions, again, as much as possible, um, visual routine. If they are used to having a number sentence up, put a number sentence up because kids reference that at school, right? If they have an alphabet line, whatever it might be, right? Making sure that they have some of those visuals that they probably reference more than we recognize up in front of them and then making sure that they have frequent, frequent breaks. Awesome. That's great. That's a lot of information. <laughs> and all really, really good. So you guys are gonna have to go back and rewatch that. <laughs> um, whew, you're amazing. Uh, so, you know, getting, getting the breaks and especially leaving the house during this time, um, a lot of people find to be super important for physical and mental health and yet some kids are really resisting it um wh what do you you know talking about building these breaks or building in a walk in the middle of the day like how do you help kids to transition out of school to leaving the house for example when they're resistant to it 
So number one, you're always going to have an easier time when you provide a least preferred activity with a more preferred activity following, okay. right? If you're saying, hey, buddy, turn off your Minecraft. I want to go take a walk with you. You're never going to get them off of the chair. But if you say, <laughs> but if you Hold say, it in front of you while you walk and you can poke the iPad <laughs> while we're down the street. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe you'll have a chance of that. <laughs> but if you say, you know, after math, we're going to go take a walk, you might have a higher likelihood of that, right? So always thinking about that, that pairing that you're doing um, next to each of those. That's important, number one. Number two, if you fit it into your daily routine and you don't necessarily make it an option. So again, especially if there's nothing else to do. If they have the, if they have the option to go play Minecraft, you're never going to get them out. But if they have nothing else to do you have again a slightly higher likelihood of them going it's not saying they're going to go though the more that you put it in your day-to-day -day, the higher likelihood you have also i will note that i've i meet with many kids on a regular basis and a lot of them have since school has started received restrictions on screen time and typically we get a lot of pushback from that i will say i've seen an incredible shift that kids are actually acknowledging liking the screen time restrictions these days and they'll never tell you that but they not, might tell me they're trusted therapists wow <laughs> but it's like they appreciate the incredible. structure you mean they appreciate the structure and they actually appreciate the break because they're a lot of kids have said that they've they told me please don't tell my parents but they <laughs> said it's actually it's kind of I kind of felt like I actually needed a break because think about it they're on screens all day long right just like we yeah. are so we they actually need a little bit of that kind of pushed push uh pushed as much as we can try to make it fun too if you can do your special time your one-on-one -on -one time in the walk that always makes it more more enjoyable if you can end mm -hmm. the walk going to Starbucks and getting a cake pop right any way that you can entice them a little bit the more, again, the more routine it becomes, the easier that'll become. Awesome. Okay. All right, one more question. Um, one of the, the questions I hear from parents a lot when I'm talking about our behavioral approach to, um, to helping to shape behavior is um, parents who are worried that kids will always only do things when they have a reward. Uh, how, do, how do we address that fear and kind of how do we how do we keep kids from just wanting more and more and more rewards first of all and then how do we get them off of like these tangible rewards at all um because a lot of life isn't like that yeah a lot of life isn't like that and a lot of life kind of is too so it's true we all we all work for a living right I like to just jokingly remind parents of that, that it's, you know, it's not that foreign for us to be doing something like this. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we're doing a direct goal shaping here, right? So our goal is that we can provide things that are going to entice our kids, that are going to get them motivated, so they feel more motivated internally. Now, again, just like uh, adults, kids, some kids are really motivated by hearing their parents praise or finishing that project, other kids aren't. So we might have kids that do, again, go to work for the paycheck versus the kiddo that goes to work because they really love what they do. And those are just personality differences too. But the goal is always sure. that number one, we're in control. So kids are never the one, you know, dictating how much the points are worth or dictating how much the rewards are worth. They help us generate the reward chart, certainly because we want their buy-in, but, yeah. We're the one in control. That's why I always recommend having a mixture of some tangible reinforcement, some social reinforcement, right? Getting to pick out the family movie night, getting to order from their favorite restaurant. Maybe in order to go get it, you have to go there. Um, ha a pet. I've had a lot of pets on reward charts. I just had that. And again, it was an experience because the child had to go with dad to pick up the pet. Right? So there are a lot of ways where you can in in integrate some family time in there. Um, special, special privileges, a later bedtime, right? A, waking up a few minutes later, whatever it might be, some special privileges integrated in a behavior chart, and then you're in control. If you want them to only, you know, pick out one tangible per month, that's on you. You go, girl, more than welcome to do that. So you can control it, but 
ultimately, again, the goal is that we can build up that internal reward system. It happens mm -hmm. with some kids. It doesn't happen with all kids, quite frankly. And the goal is that we can get them there. But yeah. we 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 want to see that they're doing these things on their own. And then we pull back on the behavior chart. And sometimes there are behaviors that just are too annoying that they just don't want to do without the reward. And again, that's where we can think about a, a system like a an allowance and try to fit it into a more kind of like natural system like an allowance right like we can figure out ways that feel maybe more typical parenting if you will totally that's good and good for the expectations adjustment as well awesome um so i certainly do get uh plenty of parents saying well i've tried all of these all of these techniques and nothing is working and uh when that happens please do reach out to us so we can support you more. You can email hello at smallbrooklyn.com. Jill is jill at smallbrooklyn.com. I'm Mandy at smallbrooklyn.com. Um, and feel free to check us out more on our website. This is part of a monthly webinar series. So we will have another free talk in the next in the months to come. Feel free to go to our website there to see what's coming up next and uh, get on our, our mailing list so you can be reminded about all of that. Um, and thank you again to Park Slope Parents and to Premier Pediatrics for uh, promoting this and getting the word out to all of their users. Definitely check them out for all kinds of services if you are interested. Thanks so much, Jill, and thanks to everyone who's come and uh, see you next month.